from our sin, even though we don't deserve it. I thank you today, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Can you stand with me as we, as we read this wonderful account? This glorious account. This true account. This true account. From the Gospel of John, chapter 20. I think in Christ alone is going to be the song we'll sing later on for you. Can you say this with me? Verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, and verse 18. 1, 2, 3, and 4, and verse 18. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. All right, let's start again. Let's start again. Are you ready? All right. I didn't give you any, any warning, did I? I count of three. One, two, three. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to him, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, but we don't know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stopping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. As for as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And as she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had laid, one at the head and one at the feet, they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away the Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. She did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be a gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to the Father and your Father, to my God and your God. In verse 18, let's say it together. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he has said these things to her. Father, thank you. Thank you for conquering sin, Satan, and death. Thank you for being our just and our justifier. Thank you that it is finished. Thank you that through you, we can have forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I want to make a special note to those who might be a skeptic today of this story. Uh, John, I don't want you to be a skeptic. <laughs> it's a simple note. It's a really simple note, like, well, back it up. Ba back it up that John doesn't want you to be a skeptic. And, and maybe the question will be, well, who cares about John? 
Well, I, I do. I really do. I, I'm glad that John wrote this account. He was one who, who went to the place where uh, he suffered. He didn't die for his faith, but he suffered for his faith. As an old man, he suffered. As an elder of his people and a good pastor, he suffered. And he, he's the one who claims that his testimony is true. A chapter earlier in uh, John 19, 35, he simply says these words. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth. So why? So that you also may believe. So John's saying, I wrote this. My testimony is true. And the whole reason I wrote it is so that you can believe it to be true. And if that isn't good enough for you, he, he backs it up in a chapter later after, after, verse, after chapter 20. In chapter 21, verse 24, he says this. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now, John wants us to believe that it is true. I want to submit to you two things today and then give you an acronym to help you focus on uh, what we're to do as believers since we believe the resurrection. Two things to focus on. That we have here true testimony, but not only true testimony, we have transforming testimony. You've heard it said, right? You've heard, you've heard better sermons and better preachers say it something like this. Many people miss heaven by, what, 18 inches or about 18 inches. They know it here, but they don't trust it here. I guess, actually, in biblical days, uh, the center of your heart would actually be your bowels. So maybe it's more like a, a foot, foot and a half, to two, two feet. But this is a true testimony, and it is a transforming testimony. It's a true testimony to the, to the demons. What does, the, what does the scripture say about the demons? That they what? They believe and they shudder. So it's not good enough to have an intellectual assent that these things actually happened. Anyone who has any sense of his, history would know that these things have occurred. 2,000 years ago, there was a man named Christ, and he died a horrible death. And strange things happened that proved that he did do what he claimed and what the scriptures claimed and what the eyewitnesses have said that, they, that, that he did. There's the empty tomb. Well, where's the body? Where's the body is a good question. Corpus Christi, where's the body? Present the body. Wouldn't this be so favorable to those who were trying to say this didn't happen? To simply say, well, listen, on a Thursday about 2.30, we got it. Here it is. Didn't happen. There was no such Thursday or Friday or any other day of the week. It had been really convenient for them to present the body. They couldn't. You know why? It wasn't there. Buddha, there. Muhammad, there. Christ, grave, just as John reported, it's empty. It's empty. Well, what about the first day of the week being the, the time of, of these Jews starting to worship? Not on Saturday, not on sundown on Friday, not on the Sabbath, but on Sunday? What well, says right here, in, in our text this morning, in John 20, now on the what? On the first day of the week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That would be the first day. Sunday is the first one. That's how we start the song for our little kids. And that's how we should start our lives. And that that Sunday means everything to us. It means everything to us. That's why Jews would stop to worship uh, on their normal worshiping time, and they would start to worship on Sunday, first day of the week. 
And then this is a silly account of, of a woman named Mary who would see the empty tomb first. Other accounts tell us about Mary the mother and, and others that were there. But in John, we just see a, a highlight of this one woman, Mary. Mary from where? Mary from Magdalene. Luke tells us that this was the same Mary in Luke chapter 8, verse 2, who was what? Filled with how many demons? Not one demon, not two demons, but seven demons, one for every day of the week. And this was the one who saw the empty tomb and who saw the resurrected Lord and who didn't recognize him at first. And that's another thing. If I were to write a, a, a story, a religious story, and I wanted more people to believe it, you know what I wouldn't do if I was trying to get a lot of followers? First of all, if I knew it was true, I wouldn't die for it. Or if I knew it was false, I wouldn't die that die to try to preserve this lie. That's one thing. But if I were trying to fabricate a story, I would not put in the story, Mary sees Jesus in the empty tomb, and then Jesus says, and she didn't recognize him until they spoke. Then even after that, he said her name, and then she got it. Why is that in here? Because let me submit to you, that's exactly how it happened. That's exactly how it happened. So let me submit to you that this is not only a true testimony, it is a transforming testimony. Let's look for a minute here at Peter. Uh, one of the interesting things that John mentions here is this competition that him and Peter have. Twice in these 18 verses, John, who wrote this, this eyewitness account, mentions this wonderful male fact that he what? He outran. He outran Peter. <laughs> he outran him. Now, maybe it is that Peter was a little bit older and uh, John was a little sprier, but for some reason he puts it in there twice. So let's look about Peter for a minute. I, and I want to just, just take, our, take the rest of our time today to focus on this wonderful truth, that we can know it here, but if we don't trust him, with our, with our very being, our very soul, our very heart, our very existence, then we can miss who he is. And we can know all sorts of knowledge about him, but not know him. I want to submit to you today that I want everyone here to be transformed by God's Holy Spirit. As Peter was. So you see, Peter, when Jesus, this is, so let me give you a time frame here. So we know Easter Sunday. Back it up, we have Good Friday where he was crucified. We have the Thursday where he was celebrating the Passover with his disciples. And around that same time, Jesus starts telling, telling the disciples, getting them ready for what is to come, for, for his crucifixion, for his Via Della Rosa going down the way of the cross, going to the, to the skull where he would be crucified between two thieves. And, and right as he's saying that, Peter interjects something. Peter says this, though they all, this is Matthew 26, verse 33, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I say, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. He had all the knowledge. He had lots of passion, but he had no transformation. So many times people will walk into a church with all sorts of knowledge, you know, gain some more knowledge, and they'll leave without any transformation. That's a sorrow, 
that's a, that's a horrible, horrible existence. To know all sorts of knowledge, yet not have the power of God's Holy Spirit living inside you. What a wonderful experience whenever someone comes under the power of God's Holy Spirit, the transforming power. So whatever sin has beset that person before the infilling of the Holy Spirit in their life has now been set free. Whatever understanding that they've had about God before God's Holy Spirit has gotten upon them and transformed them, then they have clear understanding. Peter, again, when he, after he had denied Christ, is going back to his business. What was his business? He was a what? Fisherman. And he was out fishing. But lo and behold, who shows up? Who shows up? The resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ doing? What's he doing when Peter's out fishing? He's what? Got a coal fire making a meal of fish. And then Christ restores Peter. It's the process of transformation that Peter's going through. How many times did Peter deny Christ? Three times. How many times did Peter, did Christ ask Peter, do you love me? Three times. What is the command of Christ? You feed my sheep. And what is what happens in the rest of Peter's life? He's transformed by the Holy Spirit. I want to submit to you as well the end of Peter's life. Now, we don't know from the Bible how Peter died. We see a hint, and we'll share that, that really big hint of how Peter died. But what scholars tell us and historians tell us is that he was crucified upside down. So anytime you see this someone, I have a friend that, that uh, likes this metal band called Behemoth. And Behemoth, which is a reference to an Old Testament uh, monster, essentially, um, they, they sell merchandise like bands and other things do. You know one of the merchandise that this band Behemoth sells? A really nice nifty black cap with an upside down cross on it in silver. So I came to him one day and I said, wow, that is so cool that you're wearing St. Peter's cross as a reminder that he was not worthy to die the same death that Christ died. That he wanted to be crucified upside down. He wasn't really sure what to say about that. But you see, Peter went from being scared and denying Christ and a, and a teenage girl coming to him and says, are you too one of his followers? No, I'm not. He went from that to being restored when Christ made him suffer to being filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, or Matthew 28, or Acts chapter 1, verse 8, rather, to at the end of his life, having this prediction that Jesus told him to come true. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, talking to Peter, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands. And another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him simply, follow me. And he did follow. Let's take for a minute Luke's account of these events. 
Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 50. Fifty-three. Luke twenty-four, starting in verse fifty, tells us what disciples are to do once they truly believe that Christ really was risen from the dead. This is what we're to do. May I submit to you? This is how we can be woke. Woke. All right. This is an acronym. It's an acronym. And the, I'll tell you the acronym of, for woke, okay? We all need to be woke today. If you've ever wondered if I was a woke pastor, I am this kind of a woke pastor. You need to worship Jesus. You need to obey Jesus. You need to know the joy of Jesus. It's W-O-K, right? You know, worship Jesus, obey Jesus, know the joy of Jesus. And this was a little bit of a stretch, but I had to work out the E. Every day, bless the Lord. Every day, bless the Lord. And I want to show you real quickly from Luke chapter 24. After the disciples had, had seen Jesus and they had spent some days with Jesus and then Jesus ascends back up into heaven, we, we were going to see Luke's account of a very familiar verse to us that Matthew talks about, and that's the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. We'll also see... The Acts version of that, which is what? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But here's, here's, here's Luke's version. And he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. Oh, what a wonderful thing that is. So this blessing is the Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20 blessing. It's, the, it's actually the commission. This blessing here. It is in reference to the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make what? Disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you to the end of the age. This is the Acts 1-8. Uh, when, when Luke records this in Acts, this is how he, he says it. Um, you will be my what? witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you make sure I'm saying this right but you but you will receive power rather but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth well what's happened here this blessing that he gives to them is the power of God's Holy Spirit. This is the command to go to all the nations. Verse 47, it's not on your screen, but it says this. I'll start with verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Verse 48 says, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. That power from on high would soon come at the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes on his people in the book of Acts. That is the transforming power. That is the power that isn't just, I know about Jesus, but I, I now know him. And I now have the power to do what he wants me to do. I didn't have the power before. Here's the woke part. Verse 50 while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Verse 51. Verse 52. And they what? They worshipped him. They worshipped him. For a group of Jews to start worshipping Jesus 
shows that they believe Jesus to be Yahweh God. Yahweh God. They worship Jesus. You want to be woke? You want to be awoken from your sins? Be alive with Christ by worshiping him. Not only that, it says they return to Jerusalem. We just read in verses 47, 48, that Jesus wanted them to go back where? Go, go back to Jerusalem. They were in Bethany. Go back to Jerusalem. So what are they, what are they doing there? They're simply obeying Jesus. We need to worship Jesus. We need to obey Jesus. And then what does it say? And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with what? Great joy. Have you lost the joy of your salvation? It's found by worshiping Jesus, obeying Jesus, and then you and I can experience the great joy of Jesus. And next, verse 53 says, and they were continually in the temple blessing God. Now this is a peculiar phrase for me, blessing God, that we can bless God. But it's in the Bible, isn't it? It's in the Bible. I mean, oftentimes we think God blessing us, and we, 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 we totally get that. But did, did you know that, that the Psalms speak all day long about us blessing God? That we can bless him by proclaiming rightfully who he is. We can bless him. We can bless his name. When we as fallen, sinful mankind receive his mercies, Receive his goodness and grace. And then go and tell others about his mercy, mercies and goodness and grace. That is a way that we can bless God. May we do that. May we be woke, worship Jesus, obey Jesus, know the joy of Jesus, and every day bless the Lord Jesus. Now we can't do that in our own strength. We have to do that with the Holy Spirit's power. In Acts chapter 10, we see Peter following through with his commission and his empowering. Commissioned by Jesus and his empowering by the Holy Spirit. We see him go to Cornelius' house. One of many, many examples where Peter is showing that he's following the commands of Christ. It's not on your screen, but Cornelius in Acts 10 is the person being talked to here. And Peter says, we are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen. By us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one who God has appointed judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify, testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Well, how did Peter get the boldness? The power of God's Holy Spirit. The same power that rose Christ from the dead. And that power is available to us today. Not because of anything that we have done, but because of a good, gracious God who gives to all those who would ask. Would you be one that asks today? Would you be one of those who say, Lord, I need forgiveness of my sins I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. I want to be empowered to do the things you want me to do and to say no to the things you don't want me to do. Father God, save me. Fill me with your Spirit. Make me and mold me into who you want me to be. Father, you're good. I thank you for all those that are here. I help I pray, Lord, that you would help us trust you, obey you, worship you, know the joy that only you give, 
and that we would bless your name every day. Fill us with your spirit, Father. Help us, to, help us to receive revival in our own souls, those of us that are saved. Help us to go back to our first love. Father God, if there's someone that doesn't know you today, help, help them, God. Save them. Awaken them, Father. Take them from being dead to being alive in you, Jesus. Thank you for coming back from the dead. We believe it. And we know, God, that you transform people. Thank you for transforming me, and you're still in the process of transforming me. I pray that for my brothers and sisters here, that you would continue the sanctification process. Help us be more like you, Jesus. We ask this in your name. Amen. Now I want to turn your attention these last few minutes together on this Easter morning of 2023, that we would now focus our attention on the Thursday before the Friday. So what we'll do now is we'll, as we have done last week, we'll take the Lord's Supper together. And then we'll sing a song. And then we'll leave this place. I'll pray in the power of God's Holy Spirit. And we reach the nations and the neighborhoods and the families and all those we know with the goodness of Jesus. By way of common belief, by way of stating one of the many things that we believe as believers, can we say together the most controversial words that this world ever can hear? Can we say these words together in a statement of, this is what I believe? And if you don't believe it, don't, don't, don't say it. That would be disingenuous. And I don't know if it's on your screen, but it's John 14, 6. And Jesus' words, very simply, are, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Will you stand? And can we say that again together? Okay, three. One, two, three. I am the way and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. The only way to the Father is through Jesus. Peter says he bore, he himself bore our sins on that tree. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Paul reminds us that we need to examine ourselves before we take the Lord's Supper. We spent much time last week talking about how to examine yourself rightly, just to remember those things that we talked about last week. If you're not a believer today, we welcome you to watch, and it's, there's much for you to learn, much for you to witness as other believe, as believers would take and remember the Lord's Supper. But if you're not a believer today, first of all, you can get that straight. You can get that straight between you and the Lord. I encourage you to do that. I can't force you to do that. I can't manipulate you to do that. I can just simply ask you, would you trust in Jesus? Trust in him for salvation. There's no other name under heaven by which man may be saved. Only his name. And if you are a believer today, then you're welcome to take the Lord's Supper. If you are a believer and, and you are living your life and there's no unrepentant sin. There's no unrepentant lifestyle. I'm not saying that you're sinless. None of us are. But if there's this attitude of, I know this is a sin. I'm not doing anything about it. I don't care about it. I'm just going to continue in my sin. That will be what we call unrepentant sin. But if you're someone who, like Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am, what can save me from this body of death? 
And you think about the, the goodness and graciousness of God, the Savior saving you on that cross. And you were wanting him to transform you. And that's okay. You can, you can come and, and be like the rest of us, sinners who are being turned into more like Christ through this process of sanctification. So that's a bit of a warning. If you're not a believer, please don't take the Lord's Supper. Some can be sick. Some can die if they do, Paul says. If you are a believer and, and you're, you're in unrepentant sin, don't take the Lord's Supper. N next warning would be, if you, if you are a believer and there's some issue between you and someone else and you, you, you have no idea to, to, to work that out, be a warning to not take the Lord's Supper for you as well. But if you are one of those who who would like to come and remember the sacrifice of Christ. Then we'll pray. I'll ask you to come and uh, leave your seat. Come and take the Lord's Supper. Return to your seat. Take the top layer off. The bread is here. Take the next layer. Juice is here. And then we'll take the Lord's Supper together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you that you loved us enough that you had your body broken and your blood spilled so that we could be forgiven while we receive you as king. We proclaim you as Savior, and we thank you that you rose again, and we ask this in your name, amen. You can come to the table and then return to your seat. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, these things. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Church, will you take and eat? And remember the body that was broken for you and me. First Corinthians eleven twenty five tells us this. Paul says, In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Church, will you take and drink and remember the blood shed for you and me? Now, if you'll stand as we close our time together and sing the, the song in Christ alone.
is risen. Easter 